when three women vanish without a trace, investigators comb for clues and find themselves on the trail of a savvy serial killer. Without witnesses, detectives are at a total loss to find a missing woman. To solve this case requires an act of God. When a woman disappears from under her own roof, investigators suspect that she was murdered, but getting to the bottom of it will require some sophisticated technology. Most murder investigations begin with a body, but when the body is missing, detectives face the ultimate challenge, catching a killer when the victim is presumed dead. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Like and subscribe. Tips hotline. It was a Monday, June 19th, 1989. Okay, when police in the Kansas out. City suburb of Overland Park, Kansas, received a call from worried parents. Their daughter, 24-year-old Joan Butler, hadn't shown up for work that morning. She hadn't even phoned in. No one had seen her since early the day before. That's interesting because... Uh... Though she had been gone just over 24 hours, her parents were convinced something terrible must have happened to prevent her from contacting anyone. Police agreed to check on her. When investigators searched Joan's apartment with one of her friends, they found no sign of her. And according to Detective Pat Hinkle, no sign that she planned on being away. Uh, no bags had been packed. Uh, the makeup, her makeup was still around the sink. No clothing appeared to have been removed from the apartment, so the only thing missing was, was Joan. They learned that Joan had spent Saturday night with her girlfriends. At 4 a.m. Sunday, she went home. That was the last time they saw her. Joan Butler wasn't the kind of person to leave without a word. She saw her parents at least once a week and socialized often with her friends. She wouldn't miss work without good reason. In her apartment, her friend pointed out to police the clothes Joan was last seen wearing. So she had definitely made it home but her purse, wallet, and her car were missing. By roll call Tuesday morning, the mystery had deepened. A check of Butler's bank hand account hand revealed hey, that $300, the daily maximum, had been withdrawn from an ATM at 6 a.m. Sunday, just two uh, hours after she was last on, seen. Uh, there, it happened again early Monday and early uh, Tuesday. All the ATMs were in the Kansas City area. None had video cameras. The pattern suggested that someone else was in control of Joan Butler's account, and maybe in control of Joan. Her family and friends posted leaflets all over Kansas City, describing Joan and her car, and pleading for help to find her. Her disappearance made the news, but turned up no leads until one week later. On June 25th, police got their first tip. Sir, can I speak Joan's car had been
bedroom spotted outside an apartment complex 40 miles from her home. The man with Joan's keys told the officer that he borrowed them from his buddy inside. The officer suggested they go in and sort things out. The suspect began to escort the officer inside, then took off. Surprise and made an agile escape. The officer learned that the fugitive was a painting contractor named Ricky Cho, and the men were his crew. They also told him that Cho recently started driving a new red car, Joan Butler's car. When police examined the trunk, they discovered part of the carpet had been cut away. They also found a dark stain. They presumed it was Joan Butler's blood. According to Detective Hinkle, if that were the case, it would prove that she hadn't left of her own free will. Any experienced officer would then suspect that possibly the trunk had been used for the storage of the person who belonged to the car, you know, the missing person. Investigators couldn't be certain it was Joan's blood without having a sample from her to compare it to. They hoped a new forensic technique called reverse paternity could help them. It works on the theory that a person's DNA shares the same traits as the DNA of her parents. By taking a close look at both parents' DNA, Investigators could estimate what their children's DNA might look like. Blood samples would have to be taken from Butler's mother and father. Then the DNA from the blood found in Joan Butler's car would be extracted and compared. The meticulous process would take weeks. While awaiting analysis of the stain, detectives ran a background check on Ricky Cho. The name turned out to be an alias, one of many. His real name was Richard Grissom. He was a 28-year-old ex-con with a rap sheet almost as old as he was. His criminal background included um, uh, a history of forgery, a history of uh, auto theft, and a prior conviction of homicide. Um, uh, in which he killed an elderly woman in the city of Leavenworth, Kansas. He was charged as a juvenile in that crime and served only a few years before he was back on the street. Grissom's father was African-American and his mother was Asian, giving him a striking combination of features that allowed him to drastically alter his appearance. Throughout a decade of crime and disguise, he had evaded capture. Police worked the equation. A young woman's sudden disappearance, a drained bank account, and a stolen car. Factor in a convicted killer named Richard Grissom, and the result pointed to kidnapping, possibly murder. If Joan Butler wasn't dead yet, investigators feared she soon would be. Police fanned out across Kansas City, interviewing friends and colleagues of Grissom, but no one admitted seeing him. After Joan Butler's bank account was empty, her trail evaporated too. Investigators had no more leads. Then, on Monday, June 26th, David Roosh received a message that his daughter Christine was sick and wouldn't be coming into his optical lab where she worked. Later that day, Roosh went to her home to check on her. 
she wasn't there. Neither was her roommate, Teresa Brown, who had also called in sick. Christine's car was gone. Neither woman had checked into a hospital, and none of their friends had seen them. The women seemed to have simply vanished. The next day, their families filed missing persons reports. Hey, you're out. Both women were well liked, with close families and friends. Christine, age 22, enjoyed working at her dad's shop. Teresa, also 22, had saved enough money to enroll in college. Neither woman had any problems to speak of, and neither was the kind to shirk her responsibilities. Their behavior, like the mess in their home, was out of character. Detectives combed the apartment for clues. Their wallets were missing, but oddly, a curling iron was left on. It was all very disturbing, especially so soon after the disappearance of Joan Butler. Detectives collected hairs and fibers, including two dark hairs found in the roommate's bedding that didn't seem to belong to either woman. No blood was found in the apartment, no weapon, no sign of forced entry or struggle. In short, no evidence of a crime. The front door hadn't been forced. If there had been an intruder, it was either someone the women knew or someone with a key. It wasn't much of a case to hand District Attorney Paul Morrison. We didn't have a crime scene here. What we had was a lot of different fragments, and so our task was to try to see what we could put together from that and build a scenario and piece together what we think happened. Detectives learned that pass keys had been given to a painting company, Richard Grissom's Painting Company. What began as a missing persons case now looked like a spree of kidnappings. The day after police searched Christine and Teresa's apartment, Christine's abandoned car was found a few hundred yards from her home. On the driver's side fender were fresh flecks of blue paint, but inside they found no viable clues. Later, a check of the roommate's bank records showed another sinister parallel with Joan Butler. Their accounts were quickly drained through multiple transactions. But if investigators hoped to link Richard Grissom to the missing women, they'd need solid proof. It surfaced in the lab when the dark hairs found in the roommate's bedding were analyzed. The hairs proved to be of African-Asian origin like the suspect. That wasn't the only link. From Grissom's employees, police learned that he had rented a storage locker for his business. Detectives obtained a search warrant to have a look. Inside, they collected some hairs. And outside, a potentially bigger clue, a six-foot length of duct tape wadded up and embedded with hair. About every eight inches, there was a large number of long human hairs, and then a space, and then long human hairs, as if the tape had been used as a gag, had been wrapped around the mouth of someone. Investigators hoped this was what they needed to link Grissom to the victims. They compared the hairs on the tape to those gathered from the missing women's hairbrushes but the sun had bleached the hair found on the roof, making a definitive comparison impossible. That, along with the gag, suggested she had been held there against her will. 
The discovery raised more questions than it answered. Why was there no sign of her roommate, Teresa Brown, or of Joan Butler? Where were the women now? While investigators pondered these questions, the case progressed on another front. The results from the testing of the blood stain found in Joan Butler's trunk had come back from the lab. The DNA in the sample closely matched DNA from her parents. Physical evidence now linked Grissom to two of the three victims. Their whereabouts and Grissom's remained a mystery. As police searched for Richard Grissom, their hunt led them from Kansas City to Grandview, Missouri, 22 miles away. Grissom's own car was found abandoned in a parking lot. It was taken to the police impound lot, where detectives spent five hours processing the incriminating contents. They found false IDs and stolen credit cards, some belonging to Christine Roosh and Teresa Brown. Police also found keys to their apartment, to the home of Joan Butler, and dozens of others. Family members were brought in to identify the items. The evidence connecting the criminal to his victims was now more than circumstantial. But so far, it was moot. Richard Grissom was even now on the land, and police were no closer to catching him. Christine Roosh's father identified three rings belonging to his daughter. But still, no sign of Christine. Three days into the investigation, hopes of finding the women alive were fading. As police continued to dig, they learned through an informant that on the very day that Roosh and Brown disappeared, Grissom had rented a second storage locker in the Kansas City suburb of Stanley. He stopped using it just three days later. The manager told police a young woman had paid for the unit, but she filled out the application under the direction of a man. The manager couldn't positively identify Grissom's picture. She recalled that the woman seemed distressed, like she needed help. She signed her name, Rouge. Yet the woman the manager identified in the photo was Teresa Brown. There seemed no reason for Teresa to impersonate Christine, unless she had no choice. Detectives searched the locker, but found no signs of violence or other leads. Then, on their way out, they spotted something familiar, blue paint. This uh, storage facility had a uh, computerized gate access where you have to drive up, punch in a series of codes, your, your PIN, if you will, and then it would allow you entry into the uh, storage facility. Uh, the poles were set rather close to the touch pad, and it was apparent that several cars had run into this, these poles in the past. The paint was similar to the paint found on Christine's car. Police took chips from the poles and the vehicle and sent them to the Johnson County Crime Lab, where forensic examiner Gary Dirks analyzed them. The question paint chip displayed no differences when compared against known paint that was removed from a, a blue concrete pole beside the, the, the storage shed that Richard Grissom rented. The blue chip helped police paint a picture of what might have happened in the storage shed. Our belief of the coming and goings from, the, uh, from this storage uh, facility was that uh, that's where he was hiding out. That's where he was hiding from the police and that's where he uh, most likely was hiding Christine Rouge and very possibly Teresa Brown. As Kansas City police continued their search for three missing women, a final clue turned up on the other side of town. 
courtesy of an 18-year-old Good Samaritan. He was on his way home from work when he spotted something on the roadside. It seemed someone had lost their valuables, a checkbook, credit cards, receipts, and other papers. The young man decided to contact the owner. Her name was Christine Roosh. Police found four checks unaccounted for in the ledger. They were traced and recovered. On the morning of Monday, June 26, the day Christine called in sick, she cashed them at the drive-up windows of four branches of her bank. Within an hour, her account was emptied of $2,400. None of the transactions were filmed, but police believed Grissom was with Christine. You can look at her checks as she signs them that morning. Clearly, Christine Roosh, you know, uh, very uh, steady, legible handwriting. With each check, the uh, signature degrades more and more and more to, to the point that the last one, you, you almost can't read it. And you can only imagine, uh, you know, Christine sitting in the front seat of a car, um, knowing that uh, what her fate might be. At 10 p.m. that same day, Christine drove to an ATM in Belton, Missouri, and cleaned out the bank account of her friend, Teresa Brown. Police believe by this point, Grissom had already killed Teresa, and Christine was next. These are the last photos taken of Christine alive. Local media Kansas City police were desperate to capture the elusive the, uh, Richard Grissom. Sheet of construction paper and called it the many then they got a break. Grissom slipped up and told friends where he was heading. They informed the police, who apprehended him in Texas and brought him back to Kansas. Did you grow up in Well. The police still had no bodies, but they had a long chain of evidence leading to Richard Grissom. Besides the stolen jewelry and empty bank accounts, they amassed a wealth of forensic evidence, blood stains, paint flakes, and hair samples. Each forensic piece of evidence by itself probably did not make or break the case, but the consistent thing about all those small pieces of evidence were that they all pointed directly at Richard Grissom as being the perpetrator of these crimes. On November 4th, 1990, Richard Grissom was convicted of kidnapping, robbery, theft, fraud, and murder. He's serving multiple life sentences in the Kansas State Prison. Grissom never explained what happened back in Kansas City, but police have their own theories. Grissom had keys to the apartment of Christine Roosh and Teresa Brown, so getting in was no problem for him. He'd also done work in Joan Butler's apartment complex and obtained a key for her unit as well. To this day, the whereabouts of the missing women remains a mystery, closely guarded by Richard Grissom. I think uh, uh, Grissom is a, um, a true um, power freak, and uh, I believe that this is his last act of uh, defiance, that he was able to get over uh, on the police, uh, be able to prove that he is superior in some manner uh, because the investigators have never been able to find the bodies, and I think that's his last uh, card. A determined, experienced killer can tax a police department's resources, but so can a killer who acts on impulse. Elizabeth, New Jersey is an industrial town and a residential suburb of New York City. Like any city, it has its share of crime, and its police force is trained to handle whatever might come up through deadly force or shrewd detective work. Once a criminal is in their sights, they don't give up. Shortly after 6 a.m. on Wednesday, August 5th, 1992, a mechanic arrived for work at his auto shop. 
he spotted a car parked out front that didn't belong there. He found out the owner was Karen Sherrier. He phoned her to pick up her car, but her parents said she wasn't home. They hadn't heard from her in two days. Her family was alarmed to learn that Karen hadn't shown up for work, and that her car had been abandoned. Her sister reported her missing. Detective Christopher Kenny was assigned to the case. The family was definitely concerned right, right, right from the beginning. It was unlike her to, to not call anybody or contact anybody over a period of time. She has a lot of friends located here in Elizabeth. Uh, her family was down ashore. And she would, she would be in touch with someone. Uh, at, at, at this time, she hadn't called anyone or spoke to anyone. From the family, police learned that Karen had gone out for a night on the town two days before. One of the bars she stopped in was right across the street from where her car was found. On the same day that Karen Sherrier was reported missing, police launched a search to pick up her trail. It led three blocks away to the City of Elizabeth Recreation Pier along the Elizabeth River. There, a police dog picked up Karen's scent going onto the pier. And then the trail went cold. The search for Karen Sherrier took New Jersey detectives back to the last place she was seen, the bar across the street from where her car was parked. The owner and one of his customers recalled seeing Karen early on the morning of Tuesday, August 4th. She was with a man named Joseph Sabita. Detectives called Zabita in for questioning after learning that he had been paroled from prison just a few months before. According to Detective Kenny, at this point, he seemed a likely suspect. The criminal history showed that he had been arrested numerous times in the past, uh, and that he had also been arrested for a, a rape and had spent time in prison for a rape. Zabita admitted being with Sherrier the night she vanished. He explained they went bar hopping on Monday the 3rd and early on the morning of the 4th wound up at a tavern on Front Street. He said Sherrier was giving him a ride home when they passed a man she knew. She stopped, Zabita got out, the other man got in. That, Zabita said, was the last time he saw Karen. He said he didn't know the other man's name or where they were going. During the interview, detectives noticed a crescent-shaped bruise on Zabita's arm. He explained he had caught it in the tailgate of a pickup truck. He allowed the detectives to take photographs for the record. Once we were done interviewing him and talking to him that evening, we had to let him go because we had no evidence to hold him. Still, detectives didn't buy Zabita's story. The bruise on his arm looked a lot like a bite mark. To be sure, they sent the photographs to forensic dental consultant Haskell Askin. Uh, I did determine upon looking at the photographs that this was, uh, in my opinion, a human bite mark, and uh, uh, it was a matter of finding the teeth to match up with this bite mark. If Karen Sherrier made that mark, it would prove that more went on than Zabita admitted. But to match the teeth that made the mark, investigators still had to find Sherrier. The next day, they were back on the waterfront. This time, they brought along an officer from the New Jersey State Police Missing Persons Unit. Again, the search was futile. With no word from Karen Sherrier, and no reason for her to disappear on her own, Investigators had to assume she was dead. 
Detective Kenny had no motive, no evidence, no body, and no case. Still, he kept his suspect in his sights. Zabita was the last person seen with Karen Sherrier. We would call Mr. Zabita in, we would speak to him, talk to him again. He stayed to his story, basically. And uh, we spent about three months just trying to find Karen Sherrier's body. Police had tried everything, from interviewing witnesses to tracking with bloodhounds, and had come up empty. The victim's family applied pressure to keep looking. Karen Sherrier's family and friends uh, came to us and, and they requested that uh, we do a search. They, they wanted to do a search. They felt like they, they wanted to do something to try to find her. Uh, they told us they would go out, they would make up flyers, they would get volunteers. Investigators agreed to one more search. But then, Mother Nature intervened. The worst storm in a century walloped the New Jersey coast, churning up the entire Elizabeth River waterfront. Once the flooding subsided, Sherrier's family insisted that the search proceed. Some 30 police officers, firefighters, and civilians combed the banks of the Elizabeth River, not far from where Karen's car had been found. But the odds of finding anything now seemed astronomical. They searched all day without turning up anything. Then, Near the railroad bridge, a searcher noticed something in the weeds a few feet from the water's edge. He'd found a human skull. It was apparently washed up by the storm, then left behind as the waters receded. It was an amazing find, but was it the remains of Karen Sherrier? The teeth would provide proof positive, except that every last one of them was missing. The search for Karen Sherrier turned up a skull in the Elizabeth River, but without the teeth, the first solid clue seemed utterly useless. Investigators brought Haskell Askin back on the case to apply his expertise. His first finding was unsettling. Examination of the skull uh, suggested to me that the teeth had been uh, forcibly or traumatically uh, removed from the skull. Even though the teeth were missing, Askin found distinguishing traits in the skull. The shape of the sockets where the teeth had been, the shape of the roots, and a distinctively shaped bone along the sinuses. Askin then compared his findings to skull x-rays taken by Sherrier's dentist. There was no doubt in Askin's mind. The skull was Karen Sherrier's. Armed with these findings, detectives returned to the Zabita household and served an arrest warrant on Joseph Zabita. Down at the station, he revised his story. We explained to him what we believe happened. Uh, we told him what evidence we did have. Uh, after talking with Joe Zabita for, for a little bit of time, uh, Joseph Bede admitted to us that he did, in fact, uh, kill Karen Sherrier. As before, Zabita said they left the tavern in the victim's car. By now, they had spent several hours together, and he had slowly won Sherrier's trust. Then he betrayed it. They drove to an access road down by the Elizabeth River. There, he ordered her to stop the car. They began to fight, and Zabita hit Karen in the face. He couldn't recall how many times. He struck her. Uh, once he struck her, she wasn't moving. He was nervous, worried. Zabita left her there. Then, he parked her car across from the auto body shop and walked home. What happened there? Zabita never explained why he cut off the victim's head. 
police speculate that Zabita, worried after being questioned about the crime, returned to the scene and tried to destroy the victim's physical identification. In our legal system, a confession may not guarantee a conviction. Cases are won on the merits of the evidence. Without the victim's teeth, Investigators couldn't prove she made the bite mark on Zabita's arm. They had nothing to definitively link the suspect to her. So they asked Zabita to show them where he dumped the body. Police divers never found the remains. Detectives built their case on what they had. Eyewitnesses who saw Zabita with the victim on her last night alive, and the x-rays of the victim's skull. Joseph Zabita pled guilty to aggravated manslaughter and was sentenced to life in prison. He won't be eligible for parole for 25 years. Investigators traced Karen Sherrier's murder to a chance meeting with a sinister stranger. Detectives in South Portland, Maine, had far less to go on. On August 16, 1991, police were called to the home of William and Pearl Bruns. Pearl's daughter, Elaine, was worried because she hadn't heard from her mother in three days. So when was the last time you spoke with your mother? Pearl Dad, never went far Tuesday from home now. and always phoned her. Okay. Detective Linda Barker spoke with Elaine. The daughter was very adamant that her mother always called her at least once or twice during the, the week. She calls me like two, three times a week. I didn't hear from her. Inside, the first thing the detective noticed was droplets of dried blood starting in the kitchen sink and trailing through the house. I saw drops of blood at the sink. I saw drops of blood um, as you go into the bathroom and in the bathroom sink. Indeed, there was a lot of drops of blood in various places throughout the home. Elaine explained that her mother was a hemophiliac and bled easily when cut. Pearl had cut herself in the kitchen on the day Elaine last saw her and had rushed to the bathroom to dress the wound. Along the way, she must have left a trail. Aside from the disconcerting bloodstains, most of the Bruns' home was neat and orderly, but the bedroom was a shambles. Um, yeah, I don't know where she would have been going, but this is not the way she passed. It looked as though Pearl was interrupted while packing to leave. Oh, look, there's some more blood. On the suitcase were more yeah, drops of blood. Like I said, even a small cut. Well, I mean, it's unusual to get it she... On the bookcase, Elaine noticed oh, something that upset her more than the blood. Mm -hmm. Well, she never took her this mother's thing off. friendship this is from ring. Her best friend, she got it 14 years ago, and it's never. Been Elaine seen. explained that Pearl never went anywhere without yeah. it. And you just now found that? Yeah. She also said that um, Pearl had not taken her car. Uh, Pearl loved her Cadillac and it was still sitting in the garage and she said there was no way her mother would leave without her beloved Cadillac. The Cadillac might have been the only beloved thing in the home. After five years, the Bruns marriage had soured. Elaine said when she last saw Pearl, she was depressed. Her credit cards were maxed out. Her husband complained of Pearl's spending. Pearl had told Elaine, I'd be better off dead. She wondered if Pearl might have done something rash. There was no sign of her anywhere in the house. The one place the Portland police hadn't looked was a place Pearl rarely ventured, the cellar. didn't find her, but they found more blood. It was red, not brown, so it looked fresh. 
do agree that this doesn't look like it's blood. With Pearl nowhere to be found, the logical person to question was her husband, William. He was a truck driver who was out on the road. Hi, what's your mind? When he returned, William Bruns recapped his last day with Pearl. After Elaine left, he said, an argument broke out over the same old thing, money. Around six that evening, he left the house. He said he went to a donut shop, ran some errands, then stopped for dinner. When he got home, Pearl wasn't there. She didn't return, and he never gave it another thought. It became very apparent that she didn't just leave, and he just didn't care. Barker launched an exhaustive investigation into the whereabouts of Pearl Bruns. She questioned neighbors. She visited Pearl's old haunts. No one had seen Pearl since she'd been reported missing. Next, Barker phoned taxi services, bus depots, and airlines. Every call was a dead end. If Pearl had left town, it seemed she'd gone on her own two feet or hadn't really left at all. With no sign of Pearl, the detective returned to speak with William Bruns. A casual remark turned into a potential clue. I said, gee, Bill, you've, you've uh, had your carpet cleaned. And he goes, oh, no, I, I haven't cleaned it at all. And I said, well, then you've replaced it. I mean, this is like brand new rug. I mean, that's how clean it was. And he said, no, I, I haven't cleaned it and I haven't replaced it. But a check with neighbors revealed that he had rented a commercial carpet cleaner a few days earlier. Why he would cover up such a trivial matter made investigators only more suspicious. By now, two months had passed since Pearl Bruns had dropped out of sight. No one had seen her or heard from her. The police suspected she wasn't simply missing, but murdered. They'd handled the case as a homicide. They used cadaver dogs to continue their search. They combed rivers and woods and other places where a body would likely be concealed. None turned up. Their main suspect was William Bruns, who still seemed unconcerned about his wife's disappearance. Bruns drove his refrigerated delivery truck throughout New England and into Canada. If he were the killer, he could have disposed of his wife anywhere. A check of the truck revealed it had been scrubbed clean. No traces of blood were found. In Maine, Homicide investigations are conducted by the state police. Sergeant Mike Harriman was assigned to the case. Harriman began with the Bruns' home, if only to rule it out. Uh, we wanted to better search the home and the surrounding areas to see if possibly uh, Pearl's remains were within the home, uh, in the basement, or in the surrounding area, possibly buried in a shallow grave. On November 17th, Investigators paid another visit to William Bruns. This time, they brought a cadaver dog to search the woods around the house. The search was another dead end. In the cellar, the dog detected something. Yet when police dug, they found nothing. Quick. It likely will be. While the search was mine. proceeding, Harriman interviewed William Bruns. Suddenly, the normally stoic Bruns seemed shaken. He broke down and started crying. And we thought, well, maybe we're going to begin to hear something here. And then he just reiterated, I wouldn't hurt my pearly. Now that the case had moved from missing persons to homicide, the detectives analyzed the dark brown stains found all over the Bruns' home. Maybe not all of it was pearls. Perhaps it wasn't even blood. They didn't want to overlook any detail.
at the state crime lab, forensics expert Ron Kaufman ran two tests. The first simple test would determine if the stains were actually blood. It proved positive. The second test would determine if the blood was human. He used an enzyme that reacts to human blood proteins. It reacted, proving the blood was human. But the lab couldn't determine if the blood was pearls. Uh, we had no record of uh, Mrs. Brun's blood type. So eventually, uh, we sent samples of the blood that we found on the suitcase, along with a, a blood sample from her daughter and the biological father of that daughter uh, to a private DNA laboratory uh, where they conducted uh, what they call reverse paternity testing on the samples. The reverse paternity test yielded a match. The blood came from Pearl Bruns. The blood evidence gave the state police enough evidence for a warrant. They returned to Bruns' home and began looking for more blood, enough to indicate foul play. This time, they sprayed the entire house with luminol, a chemical that makes even the faintest residue of blood glow in the dark. Detectives were astounded by the results. And the whole area lit up bright green, the whole carpet, the wall. Um, it was quite incredible. You could actually even see footsteps where someone had walked through uh, the blood. And you could also see where someone had cleaned the carpet. You could see the motions back and forth where someone had, had attempted to clean it. And, and indeed had cleaned it by the naked eye, but the luminol could pick up the blood. Detectives submitted the stains to the forensics lab. As they feared, it was Pearl's blood in fatal amounts. Detectives concluded that William Bruns had lied about more than cleaning his carpet. But to prove murder, they needed the body. Police believed that Pearl Bruns was murdered in her home, but they weren't at all certain they'd find the body there. Cadaver dogs couldn't pinpoint anything. Sergeant Mike Harriman knew they needed more drastic measures. We had either the choice of removing the house from the foundation and digging that cellar with a backhoe, or finding an alternative means, which was ground penetrating radar, to thoroughly scan that basement <clears throat> to see if there was a disturbance in that soil. Ground penetrating radar beams high frequency radio waves into the earth. The reflected waves can detect anything from fuel tanks to power lines by revealing changes in the soil structure. Detectives turned to geophysicist Scott Culkin to conduct the search. If you think of, of soil layers being lain down horizontally, uh, they have a certain structure. And if that structure is uh, compromised, by a shovel, a backhoe, uh, somebody digging. Uh, the soil structure, again, is destroyed. If anyone had dug in the Bruns's cellar, GPR would reveal it. On the morning of September 11th, detectives returned with another warrant. The GPR made pass after pass across the dirt floor. We have one depression. About 90 minutes into the survey, the GPR detected an anomaly, a spot where the soil was disturbed. We informed the Maine State Police of the presence of an anomalous area, and that anomalous area was approximately five feet by 18 inches wide, uh, suggesting a, the presence of, of some sort of burial pit. Something was down there. The digging began. After five minutes, police uncovered an oblong object wrapped in plastic and bound with a rope. It was a human body. The body was taken to the medical examiner's office for autopsy. On one arm, they found a wristwatch with a name engraved, Pearl Bruns. The examination showed the victim had been struck hard across the face. It was more than her frail body could bear. 
She had a broken orbit of her eye. She had a broken cheekbone, broken nasal cannula. Uh, Pearl bled to death. If she had been uh, given uh, first aid or a rescue had been called to that home that day, she would have survived the injuries. Confronted with the evidence, William Bruns pled guilty to manslaughter. He was sentenced to 15 years. Bruns never explained why he let his wife bleed to death without calling for help. Police know the couple was arguing, perhaps over Pearl's spending. The half-packed suitcase implied she was threatening to walk out. What is certain is the case assembled against William Bruns. The forensics in this case was extremely important. I had done a considerable amount of legwork over the past year and yet didn't have the tools that the state police actually had, the, the cadaver sniffing dog, the luminol, uh, the access to the ground penetrating radar, all these tools made the discovery of Pearl's bo body possible. Without that, we, we could literally still be looking for her. Time was, police had to produce a body to prove a murder. No more. Now, murder can be proven when the victim is merely presumed dead. Investigators find a clue they think will lead to a killer's front door, but instead find themselves heading down a blind alley. Now their most important evidence is withering before their eyes. When a man reports his wife missing, her abandoned car becomes the biggest clue, but it's the nosy neighbors who drive the investigation. Four months into her marriage, a woman disappears. But when her body turns up, it's clear she was no runaway bride. Investigators must rely on flimsy evidence to bag her killer. For some lovers, marriage can be murder. Even though proving it may pose a challenge, killers can't divorce themselves from the consequences of their broken vows. morning hours of December 28, 1995, Melinda and David McLean let themselves Becky! into the apartment of their sister-in-law, Becky Vargas. The telephone and electricity in her unit hadn't been switched on yet. Rebecca? Becky was separating from her husband and had just rented the Ogden, Utah apartment. Becky! She had told her husband, Stephen Vargas, that she was going to try to start organizing her belongings and would return in an hour or two. But that was several hours ago. Stephen had asked Melinda and David to check on her, since they lived nearby. Melinda, who was Stephen's sister and Becky's best friend, was glad to go. Though they didn't see Becky, all seemed quiet and safe. leaving them unprepared for what they found. Becky Vargas lay dead in the leaves outside the building. Even before the sun was up, the Weber County, Utah Crime Scene Investigation Unit began its day processing the murder scene. The victim's blouse had been pulled up. At first glance, the condition of her clothes made her appear to be the victim of a random sexual homicide. But a closer look revealed the story was not so simple. Criminalist Russ Dean thought the scene might have been staged. It was as if her body had been moved from one location to another. Uh, her arm was under her body as if she'd been dragged. 
Her coat was removed and was under her body. The leaves were bunched up in certain locations around her arms and legs. And there was no other obvious indication of any type of sexual assault. In fact, though the victim had suffered a head injury, most of the blood had pooled at her feet, suggesting she'd been turned around. Whoever did this had apparently tried to throw off the investigators. The forensics team documented and collected a set of car keys, a cigarette lighter, fragments of blood-spattered leaves, and most significantly, the apparent murder weapon, a broken flashlight stained with blood and entangled with hair. They spent six hours sifting through every inch of the area before they were satisfied. They determined that although the body had been repositioned, the victim hadn't been moved far. The only blood found was just a few inches from where she lay. Because the blood-stained flashlight was the most compelling clue, it was analyzed first at the Utah State Crime Lab in Salt Lake City. Investigators could see that it had a partial fingerprint on it, stamped in blood. According to latent print examiner Scott Spute, a bloody fingerprint can be even better than a smoking gun. When we have a bloody fingerprint, for example, it's the victim's blood, it's not her finger, it's someone else's finger on the evidence. It's a crucial pinpointing item of evidence in which we can identify someone being at that crime scene, leaving that bloody fingerprint behind at the scene as they left. It would be bad practice to home in on that one print. The lab had to inspect the flashlight for additional prints. The obvious ones and the ones that remained invisible. It required two separate processes. Blood stains, because they're not oily, can flake or rub off. To fix them in place, the flashlight was heated to 100 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. After I heat it on, I then put a, a stain on there, which is called a metal black, which reacts to the blood and makes it very visible and oftentimes brings out areas of blood that were invisible prior to treatment. To develop the latent or unseen prints, the flashlight was exposed to super glue vapor. The adhesive bonds to the moisture on the print, creating a durable shell that exposes and preserves it. Then, a fluorescent dye is applied, which adheres to the super glue. The latent prints shine under ultraviolet light. Testing revealed no other blood-stained prints. The original one, along with the latent prints, would have to do. Once a suspect was isolated, investigators were confident that the bloody fingerprint was all they'd need. While the clues were being scrutinized, Melinda McLean and her husband David went to the police station to give their statements. Melinda told police that she'd been best friends with Becky Vargas for 14 years. And then, and then we went back. Becky had been married to her brother, Stephen Vargas, for nine of them, but it looked like their marriage was coming to an end. As far as she knew, the split was amicable. Though Becky was having an affair that her husband, Stephen Vargas, may have suspected, there didn't seem to be a lot of tension between the couple. In fact, it was Stephen who had called the McLeans to look in on her after the police told him they had no officers available to check on his wife. David McLean, down the hall, told police a similar story. He said that Stephen Vargas had called him just before 11 p.m. the night before the murder. Uh, did Steve at all go over there? Stephen was worried because she was away so long and the apartment had no lights. He said that he and Melinda stopped by. 
Though Becky's car was in the driveway, there was no answer. They went to a window to see if everything was okay, but stopped when they heard moaning. Did you hear that? Yeah, she sounds busy. They thought that perhaps her boyfriend was there, so they left. They went to a payphone to tell Stephen that everything was fine. They told him what they had heard, then they left. David told police that out of curiosity, they drove back to Becky's a short time later. Now they were surprised to see Stephen Vargas's Jeep parked out front. Soon he appeared from beside the building, got into the vehicle, and drove off. David said that they caught up with him. Stephen was wearing his bathrobe and slippers. He told them he wanted to check on Becky himself, but asked the McLeans not to tell anyone he was there. When David revealed this detail to the police, Melinda reluctantly admitted it was true. David told police that Stephen called them once more early the following morning. He said that Becky still wasn't home and asked them to check on her again. That's when they found her dead. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the lantern found at the scene wasn't the actual murder weapon, but it may have been used to subdue the victim. From the shape of the wound, she was apparently struck down with a hammer or something similar. No such object was located. The killer was clever enough to carry off or remove some of the most incriminating evidence. Authorities hoped he'd left enough behind. At the police station, investigators continued to talk with the McLeans. Their detailed story seemed to pivot on Stephen Vargas. Then it took a more provocative twist when the police dispatcher told Detective David Wheeloth that Vargas was on the phone, but he wasn't calling about his wife. She said that he was on the phone inquiring about his sister and his brother-in-law and if they were in fact at the police station. And I told the dispatcher, yeah, that's who we're, we're in here talking to. And if she would ask him if he would mind coming down to the police station as well. Police told him about um, Becky's murder and said that his in-laws were fine. Was aware of but he might not and, be and because Melinda and David She's saw a, him at the murder scene. Lot, no, I, I, he admitted that he was there that night, just as the McLeans had said. He peeked in the window, but he heard and saw nothing. Because the window was right next to where the victim was found, Wheeloth didn't believe him. If Steve had gone there to look and listen, uh, I don't think it would have been likely that he would have not seen Becky lying just a few feet away. His suspicious behavior and the eyewitness testimony by the McLeans was enough to get a warrant to search Stephen Vargas's Jeep and to collect his fingerprints and a blood sample. Can you, get a, uh, can you get a paper bag? Investigators were after anything that could link him to the crime scene. They found nothing but minuscule fragments of leaves, and not even many of those. Actually, I wish I could find my little The Jeep looked recently vacuumed. They collected what they could then returned the vehicle to Vargas and sent him home. The forensics team hoped they wouldn't need to rely on the leaves. Now that they had Vargas's fingerprint, they could compare it to the ones from the flashlight. Most of the prints did, in fact, match Stephen Vargas. But that made sense. He owned it. So the only one that really mattered was the one stamped in blood. The bloody fingerprint had a shape called a tented arch. Of the three features of fingerprints, loops, arches, and whorls, arches are the least common. 
and tented arches are rarer still. Only 5% of the population has them. Stephen Vargas was among that group. But the fingerprint on the flashlight wasn't clear enough to make a definitive comparison. Vargas might have left it, and then again, maybe not. I cannot say he did not leave that print behind. I can only say it's not enough to identify it positively. They thought the flashlight would illuminate the killer. Without it, their hopes of solving the case looked considerably more dim. Investigators working to solve the Becky Vargas homicide saw their most promising piece of evidence rendered useless. According to Detective Wheeloff, a case that had looked cut and dried now depended on very fragile clues. After we lost the flashlight, uh, about the last piece of, of physical evidence we had that we could try and do anything with were the leaf fragments that were recovered out of the Jeep. If investigators could find specks of blood on the tiny fragments, they would support the idea that Stephen Vargas was close enough to the body to have tracked them into his Jeep. It fell to supervising criminalist Pilar Shortsleeve to analyze the minuscule samples. Trying to see blood on a small piece of colorful leaf was difficult. So we used a stereo zoom so we could get down and look very closely at the leaves and then um, to kind of guesstimate if we had any stains and then we would do some preliminary tests. Well, Out of the five samples of leaves, enough? Pilar Shortsleeve found traces of blood on two. But she had no proof the blood was the victim's. She rushed the samples to a DNA lab for analysis, fearing it might already be too late. Whenever um, blood or body fluids are left on soil or, or samples that contain a lot of possible bacteria, the bacteria begin immediately in destroying the sample. Um, they destroy not only the cells, but they get into the DNA and start to break the DNA down. It would take three months for the results to come back from the lab. Investigators had to bide their time, but they didn't do it idly. They had to assume that the results would be negative and began to build their case some other way. Police served a warrant to search Vargas's apartment. They were after the bathrobe and slippers he was seen wearing at the crime scene. If he had beaten his wife to death, surely they'd be blood spattered. Vargas left the clothes in plain sight, easy to find. He was supposed to be wearing a bathrobe and a pair of slippers. The bathrobe had been freshly laundered. The slippers had no trace of debris on them. That in itself was strange, considering he admitted walking outdoors in them. It seemed like uh, Stephen Vargas was one step ahead of us on getting rid of any physical evidence that might link him to the crime scene. Uh, it seemed like every step that we thought of to locate that evidence was foiled. Robert? Yeah. But there was one clue he couldn't bury because it was 375 miles away in Cheyenne, Wyoming. After several weeks of wrestling with his conscience, Vargas's half-brother, Robert Esquivel, called police to tell of a favor that Stephen had asked before Becky's murder. Steve had asked him if he would come out here and kill Becky for him. Police set up a phone tap in Esquivel's apartment and had him call Vargas to get him to talk about their previous conversation. Steve had gone through this, this denying or not remembering that part of their conversation, that it had been a joke, and towards the end even got threatening. Though it stopped short of a confession, Vargas had said enough for police to arrest him on January 11, 1996 for the murder of Becky Vargas. 
but they weren't sure they had enough evidence to convict him. One month later, the results of the DNA test on the blood-spattered leaves found in Stephen Vargas's Jeep came through. A comparison of the DNA from the blood on the leaves matched Becky Vargas's DNA. The blood on the blood fragments matched Rebecca Vargas. Now yes. authorities were confident of a conviction. Where, where are you going? Based on the evidence, police put together a likely scenario. Stephen Vargas, angry with his wife for her infidelity and their upcoming divorce, confronted her at her new apartment. They fought. It escalated. And he hit her with the flashlight, knocking her out. He moved her to the side of the house, thinking she was dead. He was wrong. He wanted someone else to find the body, so he asked the McLeans to check up on her. They mistook her death throes for the throes of passion. When they told Stephen, he returned to finish what he'd begun, using a more lethal weapon. Tiny fragments of leaves told the whole story. Well, in this case in particular, we had this flashlight that had a possible fingerprint in it, in blood. And that would have been the piece of evidence that kind of closed all the loose ends. But it didn't happen. In this case, it was a very small piece of leaf that was found in a vehicle that had blood on it that came from the victim. And it was just the interesting and exciting part that something so small could be so integral in a case. Stephen Vargas was convicted of first-degree murder and is now serving 20 years to life. The case of Becky Vargas began with the discovery of her body. But when a person just disappears, it's not clear that a crime has even been committed. In this story, the names of the victim and the killer have been changed. On the morning of July 31st, 1987, Dan Remington of San Diego, California, was taking his kids to the YMCA. En route, he noticed his wife's abandoned car on the side of the road. Not wanting to alarm his children, he dropped them off at daycare, then rushed home to call the police. San Diego police dispatched an officer. On his way to Remington's house, he stopped to examine the vehicle. The car apparently had a flat tire. The doors were locked, and he could see no spare, nor any sign of 29-year-old Liz Remington. When the officer arrived at the Remington's home, Dan Remington told him that he last saw his wife at 10.30 the previous night when she left for work. After he saw her car at 7.30, he called the hospital where she was a maternity nurse, but she hadn't shown up. Remington admitted that their 12-year marriage was rocky. They were discussing divorce, but hadn't filed the papers yet. Dan handed the officer a key to the car and granted permission to impound it in search of clues. While it was possible that Liz's disappearance could be logically explained, missing persons cases fell under the domain of the homicide unit. They had the skills to collect and preserve every piece of potential evidence found at the scene. Check the spare yet? They found nothing obvious to indicate foul play. 
towed the car to the police garage. Any overlooked clues would be preserved in case the car required a closer look. Detectives visited a nearby convenience store, thinking that Liz might have gone there after her tire went flat. The clerk told them that she had been in the night before. She needed to break a $20 bill to make a phone call. He didn't know who she called. Police remembered that Dan Remington told them she hadn't called home. It seemed reasonable to believe she may have simply run off with someone else. Liz's sister told police that was inconceivable. She wasn't the kind of woman who would run from a failing marriage. No matter how bad things became, she'd never leave her children. Sergeant Dennis Brugos of the San Diego Metro Task Force found that was the consensus. She was very devoted to her children and her family. She helped at school, she helped at Little League, and uh, just not the type of woman that would ever walk away from her family. Liz's sister told police it was strange that the spare tire was missing. Dan had changed the oil two weeks earlier and made a point of thoroughly checking the car, including the spare. Investigators took statements from the Remington's neighbors. Many spoke of the deteriorating relationship between Liz and Dan. The information was duly noted, but in terms of evidence that any crime had been committed, Investigators had absolutely nothing. At the time of Liz Remington's disappearance, San Diego police were grappling with an apparent serial killer. Because there was no evidence that Remington had left against her will, these more violent crimes took priority. There was no body, there was no weapon, and therefore she was simply one of many missing adults throughout this county. And at that particular time, there was actually a series uh, of sorts that was going on where there was upwards of 40 women who's, who were found murdered uh, in the East County area. So certainly that would have precedent over a missing person. Four years passed since Liz Remington's disappearance. Most of the murdered women were transients or prostitutes, so she was not considered one of the killer's victims. But when a task force was formed to look into the serial killings, her file came up too, and investigators realized she was still missing after all this time. The neighbors taped statements, and the detective reports were dusted off. Well before Liz's disappearance, they had kept a close eye on the Remingtons and helped Liz out whenever they could. Over time, friction between the couple increased and neighbors grew concerned about her and the children. One even kept a log of what went on at the house after Liz disappeared. To demonstrate how the Remington's relationship had deteriorated, a neighbor told investigators about how Dan tried to sell Liz's car without her permission. According to the neighbor, Liz wasn't just surprised, she was furious. A huge fight ensued. He said that the only reason Dan didn't sell the vehicle was because Liz had the only key and wouldn't give it to him. But police recalled that on the day Liz disappeared, Dan had the key to her vehicle in his possession. Police also learned that neighbors had reported seeing Dan Remington filling in a ravine at the back of his property with a bulldozer shortly after Liz's disappearance. They said that after her disappearance, they saw him visit that part of the property every few days. 
He never ventured back there before she disappeared. Remarkably, because the case had never been officially closed, Liz's car had remained impounded all this time. Dan had sued to get it released, but lost. Technically, it was still considered evidence. Now it would be looked at more thoroughly. One of the first things investigators found were coins in the ashtray. Purportedly, Liz had been last seen by a convenience store clerk when she wanted change to make a phone call. The clerk's statement suggested she was okay. Now, investigators weren't so certain, since she had ample change in her car. They contacted the clerk to interview him again. That clerk at the convenience store uh, actually said he wasn't real sure that it was her. So that helped us to establish the fact that we didn't really know for sure whether she was there. Suspicions of foul play had been aroused. Rugos wondered if the flat tire could have been staged. He sent the flattened tire from Liz's car to Goodyear Tire and Rubber in Akron, Ohio. Their lab is designed to evaluate the causes of tire failure. Here. The tire was examined uh, on the rim. Report was the tire was flat, is still flat. There's definitely no Investigators found no outward signs of damage. Only a tiny puncture, which would have led to slow deflation. Once the leak was isolated, product analysis manager Chester Patterson took the tire off its mount and examined it more thoroughly. From the looks of it, the tire went flat after the car had stopped. We saw no damage on this tire. We saw no reason to have alerted any driver in the vehicle that something was going soft or, or whether the tire was deflating. Because in order to do that, you, the tire is beginning to come apart. And you would see that damage on the tire itself. And we saw no such damage. But he did see something he'd never seen in his 35 years experience. The tire removed from Liz Remington's car had been punctured from the inside out. tire has been punctured from the inside. See these two impressions, circular impressions, right under the punctures of the tire. And we noticed the rust that's contained in them. And it told me that somebody had taken a nail and pounded it through the inside of the tire to cause that circular nail head impressions on the liner itself. He concluded that the tire had definitely been tampered with. Four years after Liz Remington's disappearance, investigators had enough to get a warrant to search Dan Remington's house. They found nothing of significance inside. Outside, a exactly whole different story. In the yard, a police backhoe went to work excavating the filled-in ravine. Uh, the backhoe was probably two or three hours into the job when it hooked onto a piece of chain-link fence that was lying flat. Uh, the excavation slowed down. What we found underneath that chain-link fence was a tire. The tire was the missing tire from Liz's car. And underneath that tire, wrapped in sheets and blankets, was the body of a female. And a missing persons investigation became a murder case. Dan Remington was arrested and taken away. Officially, the body was considered a Jane Doe until a positive ID could be made. A forensic anthropologist determined the remains were those of a Caucasian female 
who had died of blunt trauma to the head. She had been in her late 20s to early 30s, about the same height as Liz Remington. It seemed like they had found what they were looking for, but the law required more proof than that. Forensic dentist Norman Sperber was called in. Everything hinged on the teeth. Teeth are the most durable part of the body, and we fortunately had dental films from her dentist. We were able to take films of her teeth because they were in very good condition. By comparing the shape and position of the victim's fillings and teeth with Liz Remington's dental records, Sperber was able to make a positive ID. Liz Remington had been found. Because the victim was discovered wrapped in bed linens, investigators believed that Dan killed her while she was napping before work. Afterward, he carried the body out to the ravine, buried it in a shallow grave, then rented the earth-moving equipment a short time later, piling on 8 to 12 feet of dirt. Then he drove to the scene and replaced the good tire with the one he had flattened. Next morning, he reported his wife missing, confident the police would never piece it together. His unwitting accomplice was a suspected serial killer who demanded all of the police department's resources. But the clues eventually resurfaced, exposing the crime. Though Remington's exact motive will never be known, authorities believe he couldn't bear the shame of divorce or the fact that he'd lose half of his wealth and property. In October 1992, Dan Remington was found guilty of the first-degree murder of his wife. He was sentenced to life without parole. Remington went to a great deal of trouble to hide his crime. Others take an easier approach, which sometimes makes their crimes harder to solve. On September 21, 1995, a body was discovered in a wooded area in Boise, Idaho. Plastic bags bound with duct tape encased the feet and head. From its state of decay, it had obviously been there several days. No ID was found. No attempt had been made to conceal the body. It appeared to have been hurriedly dumped there. Because of its position and wrappings, investigators couldn't even determine the victim's gender without disturbing an already disturbing scene. At this point, anything could be a clue so the body wasn't unwrapped or inspected until it got to the morgue, where it was scrutinized under controlled conditions. Okay. The tape was carefully cut away, and the bags removed and preserved. The victim was female, around 60 years old. The coroner determined that she was strangled, she was most likely killed elsewhere, wrapped up, and transported to the woods where she was found. She fit the description of Wanda Kuzmachev, reported missing six days earlier. Wanda had been reported missing by her second husband, Ben Kuzmachev, when she failed to return from work. The couple had been married just four months. Both had retired from the large firm they worked for. Wanda took a job cleaning offices. You are beautiful. Thank you. Ben, a Russian immigrant who had once been artistic director for the Idaho Ballet, 
now worked for a security company. After Ben reported her missing, okay, detectives wondered if around. Wanda had had second thoughts about her second marriage and simply run off. But a check of her jewelry and possessions showed she'd taken nothing with her. That's never a good sign. And then her body turned up. The victim's car had not been found, so the bags she was wrapped in became the most important clue. Criminalist Cynthia Hill set to work examining them. It was all she had. Well, in this case, we didn't have a murder weapon. There were no eyewitnesses, and the place where Wanda was found was not the murder scene. So all these things were playing against us. Hill fumed the bags in superglue to bring out any fingerprints. The glue, contained in foil pouches, vaporizes and bonds to the print, preserving it. The print can then be dusted with powder to make it more visible. Then photographed to create a record. Hill found only one print on the bag around the victim's legs, but so far she had no one to compare it with. Ben Kuzmichev was called to the police station to provide a set of prints for comparison. In a murder investigation, it's standard procedure to get a spouse's prints. Usually, it eliminates the spouse as a suspect. In this case, that isn't quite how it worked out. The print on the bag matched Ben's. That didn't necessarily mean he'd had a hand in his wife's murder. If the bag had been taken from the victim's own car, Ben might have handled it prior to its use in the crime. The print was lifted from a portion of the bag where one would normally grab it. In terms of evidence, it wasn't enough. These people are living together. They're touching objects that one another uh, touch. Um, th you have to be able to find a fingerprint in a location where they wouldn't normally have touched, or it's in conjunction with another piece of evidence that puts them um, at the scene. Hill still believed that the bags might contain more prints. Though she didn't have the technology to lift them, she knew that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Crime Lab did. If prints were there, the Mounties could find them, or so she hoped. She carefully packed her bags, sent them to Canada, and awaited the results. While Cynthia Hill waited for her prints to come from Canada, investigators in Idaho found Wanda Kuzmachev's car. More than a week had passed since her body was discovered. The vehicle had been abandoned in a store parking lot four miles from where she was found. Police processed the vehicle for fingerprints. They raised two prints from the trunk lid. Their placement suggested they were left by the person closing the trunk. Inside, investigators found something surprising. Nothing at all. For Detective David Smith of the Boise, Idaho Police Department, that was a significant discovery. In talking with the family members, they said that she would always carry her Jehovah Witness literature in the trunk. In fact, they said you could not put anything in her trunk because it was so full. But the trunk wasn't entirely empty. Investigators found a single drop of blood. It belonged to the victim. Whoever had put her in the trunk had also left fingerprints on the gear shift knob. Prints on the trunk and on the gear shift matched Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators faced the same challenges as before. The car belonged to Ben's wife. It stood to reason that he could leave his fingerprints on it. Still, 
it seemed strange that his were the only clear prints found, especially since he told police that as far as he knew, Wanda was the last person to drive the vehicle. The evidence suggested that Ben drove it last, leaving behind the clearest prints. Tests were conducted to show that in approximately 70% of all cases, the last person who drives the car and, and activates the gear shift lever will destroy the person's prints who drove the car prior to and leave their prints on the gear shift lever. The prints made detectives 70% sure that Ben Kuzmichev was lying. That wasn't good enough. An inspection of the car seat disclosed another clue. I knew Wanda's stature in that she was five foot four and 140 pounds. When I looked at the seat, it appeared to me to be back farther than usual for a woman of that stature to be driving the vehicle. So I placed a female of five foot four, 140 pounds inside the vehicle. She was unable to reach the pedals, which appeared to be a comfortable driving position. Conversely, I put a male matching Ben's description, 5'11", 190 pounds, into the driver's seat, and they fit very comfortable. The experiment provided more circumstantial proof that Ben was a liar, but it still didn't prove he was a murderer. By now, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police Lab had performed their tests on the trash bag used to wrap the body of Wanda Kuzmichev. The test, called vacuum metal deposition, is a state-of-the-art method for lifting difficult prints from plastic. The bag was placed in a vacuum chamber and then pelted with ions of gold, which cling to the plastic, but not to the oily prints. Then it's exposed to ionized zinc, which clings only to the gold, leaving the prints untouched and in contrast against the plastic. The process revealed a second print on the bag. According to Cynthia Hill, the position of this print was far more incriminating. The second uh, fingerprint that was developed using the vacuum metal deposition proved that he had a direct contact with that bag because the positioning of the hand was in such a way that he would be grabbing the plastic bag, wrapping the tape around Wanda, and he would be the only one that would be leaving the fingerprint in that position at that time. In most cases, that would be enough to win a conviction. But investigators weren't so sure. Proving a spousal murder on fingerprints alone would be a hard sell. The prints and other evidence they'd gathered gave them enough to get a search warrant for the Kuzmichev's home. They found no signs that this was the murder scene. But they did find the Jehovah's Witness literature that the victim's family said she never removed from her car. The items presented more circumstantial evidence that Ben had been involved in the murder. By January 1996, four months after the crime, investigators were still building their case against Ben Kuzmichev. Detective. He began to feel the circle of evidence closing in on him, and he announced he was going back to Russia. At that point, police had no choice but to charge him with Wanda's murder. If he returned to Russia, he'd be a free man beyond U.S. extradition. Though they had enough to arrest him, they weren't certain they had a solid case for murder in the first. Between the time of his arrest and the trial date, investigators continued to gather evidence against Kuzmichev. Under surveillance in jail, he couldn't make a move without authorities knowing about it. We placed monitoring devices on approximately 17 phones inside the jail at the Ada County Jail. Now, that gave us the ability to monitor his conversations as outgoing as well as whoever he was seeing as a visitor. Uh, the end result was that uh, we received nothing uh, that could be used in court. The, nothing incriminating came about the phone calls. But help came from an unlikely source. Kuzmichev had confided details of his crime to his cellmate, 
The prisoner, disturbed by Kuznichev's lack of remorse, reported the details to authorities. He had nothing to gain by doing so. Ben and his cellmate were watching TV one evening when the news media broadcast that we had located a witness who had told us that she had, in fact, sold Ben duct tape and trash bags. The inmate told us that Ben found this humorous, that he had, in fact, purchased from this lady, but they were not the ones that we were looking for that he used in the crime. The inmate's information, though hearsay, provided one more strike against Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators realized they'd gathered all they were going to get. They weren't sure they had enough. But because Ben was likely to be released and flee to Russia, they had to take the case to trial. From what police could put together, four months after their marriage, Ben and Wanda's honeymoon was over. He had been dependent on her money, but wanted to return to his homeland. She refused to go. Their animosity built, and Ben strangled her. He wrapped her body in plastic bags, emptied the trunk of her car, loaded her in, and dumped her in the woods. Then he abandoned the car in the parking lot. Based on the accumulated evidence, Ben Kuzmichev was convicted for the second degree murder of his wife, Wanda, and sentenced to 21 years to life. For Detective David Smith, solving this case meant more than simply delivering justice. You do become personally involved. I mean, this guy has come into to your town, committed this heinous act, and now you have this grieving family that you want to do everything in your power to solve this case for. And that's how I personally take it, and I know any other seasoned uh, homicide detective will tell you the same thing. When spouse kills spouse, the clues are sometimes difficult to read. But the marriage of forensic science with good detective work can bring together what the killer had tried to put asunder.